I'm Tom Bain, and this is Wine, Money, and Song. Today, I want to get into wine writers, wine ratings, and the influence they have on the wine market in general. I don't know how many times that I've been in wine stores, and I'm looking around, and I notice a couple looking at wines, and they get on their iPhone, and you see them pecking away, and they're looking up the ratings of the wines. And they're searching, and they're hectic, and all of a sudden, the one partner will turn to the next and say, just got a 92, we have to buy it. And I said, cause it's in print and it's on the internet, it makes it the Bible. <laughs> I, when I was a kid, there was a show, American Bandstand, and they used to play new music all the time. And kids used to come up and rate it. I'm giving it a 93, cause you could dance to it. And that's sort of what wine ratings remind me of. First, remember that wine writers I found are very intelligent people uh, and they have passion for wine. And they travel all over the world. They drink thousands of wines a year and they're very, very serious people. But the question is, do they have the same taste that you do? Do they like the same style that you do? And I think you have to find your confidence in your own palate. Uh, but as far as wine writers go, I remember back in 1983, I was reading Robert Parker's review of the 82 Bordeaux vintage. And I'm sitting in the shop that I was managing and I said to the importer who sells me French wines, I said to him, the 82s can't be any good. I said, that, you know, it's a hot vintage. It's a big vintage, uh, low acidity. They're not gonna age well. How the hell can they? And there was another wine writer outside of Robert Parker called uh, Robert Finnegan, who basically said that, that it isn't a great vintage. It's not gonna age well. and. They sort of locked horns on this. They went head to head. And you really don't see that anymore. You don't see that because no one wins those fights. So the gentleman who works for the importer said, if you really want to know, why don't you come to France with me this summer? And I'm doing the 82 Bordeaux barrel tasting. Why don't you come with me and we'll barrel taste. So I thought about it and you know, I was a 25 year old uh, young guy in a very, very fast lane and boring, learning about wines at the time. And my learning curve was very steep. So I was single. Uh, I didn't have any uh, constraints on me. I said, yeah, I'm gonna go. <laughs> so I think in uh, the summer of 83, we go to Bordeaux, and this is the first time I've ever went to Bordeaux. I had gone to other sections of France earlier, but I never spent any time in Bordeaux. So the next two and a half weeks, uh, I basically drank Bordeaux from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, uh, sampling probably more than 150, 82 Bordeaux. So the night we started, uh, we were in Paris for a few days. And Sunday night, we had a dinner engagement with Chateau Graysac. Uh, we had dinner with him, and then we went to taste the 82 out of barrel at Graysac. And Chateau Graysac is a very ordinary wine, a very good wine, a cru, a cru bourgeois, uh, which we sell, you know, which sold for about $15 a bottle retail. It's a very nice wine, but it's a very high production. We buy about 20,000 cases a year and sell it. It's a very nice wine, but never a great wine. So we have dinner, we chat, chat. We run over to the, to the cellar and we get the samples out. And me and my friend who I have gone to France tasting maybe 15 times in my life. So we both split off and go into different corners to be uh, not influencing each other and how we like the wines. We want to be uh by ourselves so we both taste the wines and we walk over to each other and we kind of whisper 
and we say, if Graysack's gonna be this good, how the hell good are the other ones gonna be? <laughs> so we got our answer. We got our answer in the next two weeks. The next day we went to Lynch Bage. Uh, we tasted five of their wines and, and the hits just kept, kept on, keep on coming, one after another. And the wines were so fruity and, and so concentrated and delicious. The only question that we had, would these wines make old bones? Which means, would they age well? Or would they fall apart? Would the, would the skeletal structure of the wines just fall apart? Uh, but the difference with the 82s were, they had very sweet tannins and very ripe tannins. They weren't bitter and the wines were balanced. And I thought, very highly of the wines. And the last wines we tasted on that trip were Petrus. So we started with Graysack and we ended with Petrus. And uh, the wines were just head spinning, head spinningly good. And when I got back home, what did I do? I thought, I said, I gotta buy these wines. I gotta buy these wines and I didn't have the money. So you know what I did? I sold my car and I bought 82 Bordeaux. That's what I did. And luckily, a few months later, I got a job and I got a company car. So it worked out very, very fortunate for myself. I was the fortunate son there. So a wine writer changed my life. And Parker became the most influential wine writer there was. Uh, I think he topped over 50,000 paying subscribers at one time. But his real power was he would come out with a rating on a wine, a high rating. The wines would sell out instantly and the prices would double, sometimes triple. He was the Bible. He was the Bible. And I must say that although I didn't agree 100% because he really liked the bigger wines and I liked the more elegant wines, but he was an unbiased guy. And he worked really hard and he really wanted to educate consumers to it. And I thank him. And no one has approached him afterwards. Uh, and everyone else who is in wine criticism now, to me, they imitate Parker to a great degree. And they say imitation is the uh, is a form of flattery. And I guess that's true. They uh, use this 100 point rating system, which I really don't believe in, but I'll tell you why I don't believe in that in a minute or two. But uh, Parker really changed the whole world of wine criticism. He is now retired. Uh, and I think he's in the Hall of Fame of wine writers to me. And uh, I appreciate what he did for the wine business and for me as a wine consumer. Uh, so back to wine writers in 2011, I was at a trade tasting in New York. Uh, the union of grand crew, uh, did a trade tasting. Uh, they used to come out every vintage, the new vintage was coming in in 2011, they were showing the 2009s and they show anywhere from hundred, 150 wines. And because I was in the wine trade, I used to get invited to all these trade tastings. Now, just to show a little of my credentials, uh, I've, I've traveled to many of the most famous estates in Europe. I've drank a lot of great wines in my time and I'm very lucky with that because at the time that I was doing, it's over 40 years I've been in the wine business. The wines weren't as expensive and crazy like they are now. Uh, so I had the ability to taste those wines when they weren't prohibitively priced. Uh, I visited so many of the estates, drank a lot of the great wines, uh, and I probably tasted tens and tens of thousands of wines over my career. So going to this tasting, you know, I belong there. And, and this is what I've done in my life. I, I've tasted a lot of wines. I'm a professional taster. And so I go to this tasting and they hand you three glasses and they say, go at it. And there's 150 glasses. Home viewers, don't try this at home. I go, because after the third wine, you're gonna be lost. 
all wines are going to taste like the others. So <laughs> I'm going through all the wines and what was very evident at the beginning of the tasting was 2009's super vintage. I liked them immensely. They were very ripe, soft, round, juicy fruit. Uh, were they classic? Eh, maybe not, but they were delicious. And I think they were going to be delicious from day one all the way through their aging process. So I was going through the wines and there were three wines that were rated 100 points. And 100 points is perfection. So I took time out and I tried all three of these 100 point wines. And I took my time with them. And all three wines, they were well-made wines. And I could see people really liking these wines. And I found the wines too alcoholic, too tannic, too over the top. Now, that's my taste. That's my taste. Now, I know other people will like it. So what does that mean? Does that mean the wine writers were wrong to give it 100 points? Or was my palate out in left field? Neither is true. Uh, a lot of people were going to like those wines. While a person like myself, that's not my style. That's not my taste. So each to their own. So you have to find what you like. So I finished that tasting. And what I have to go with that is when you look at wine ratings and wine scores, what I want you to do is I want you to go out, buy a few wines, and don't look at the ratings. Don't look at the ratings. Try the wines, jot down a few notes about each, then look up the ratings. And then when you find a writer who corresponds with the things you like in the wine, you maybe found a love match there. Someone who you could go and kind of gets the style that you like, and you could follow that person. Uh, over and over, you're gonna be learning. Each time you have a wine, you will be further along on that learning curve on wine. And the more wines you try, the better. And if you're only going to try wines that are highly rated, you're not going to get the context of great wines versus regular wines. If you only drive Maseratis and Porsches your whole life, you're never going to appreciate a really good car on its own. You have to put everything in a context. And so from here on in, as far as wine ratings go, Read the text. These people are very smart, these wine writers. They're very experienced and they work very hard. And it's not an easy life going overseas all the time, being away from your family. Now, you, you try many great wines, visit many great estates and meet fine people. But there's many a times they have hundreds of bland wines you try and you have to suffer pompous asses out of states too. It's just like the real world and it's hard work. And what you should do is read the words, the text that they write. And it's loaded with information about the estate, about its history and about where it's going in the future, how the wines have changed. And it's comparing one vintage against another vintage. Read that. I go, the ratings you should take with a grain of salt. I've had wines there in the high 90s and I've had wines in the high 80s, and I like the high 80s more than the high 90s. Everything is in context, so go out and do that.